Hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing. This is a podcast for wannabe fiction writers, and I'm your host, Mer Lafferty. And this is my second time recording this. You know, what's really funny is I have another podcast I'm working on right now called I Should Have Been Writing, where I'm taking the early, early episodes of I Should Be Writing and adding commentary and transcriptions. So I'm releasing them out, one of that a week and one of this a week. But the thing is, <laughs> what gets me is um, recording an entire show and then realizing you did not record an entire show. That's a very 20, 2005, 2006 mer thing to do, not 2023 mer. Um, so that was nice little callback. Not nice. It sucked. I started off my week strong, and then I recorded for about an hour, and then I lost it all and got really mad. Which, yeah. Anyway, I am Mer Lafferty. I've been doing this podcast since 2005, before I had sold one single short story, and now I've sold several books, short stories, and I'm still doing it, because a lot of the problems I had early on, I still have. Because most of our problems with writing, let's face it, have to do with our own mindset. So I'm here to tell you you're not alone and that you can write. As for accountability, I've actually not done a whole lot recently. I've been kind of plotting out uh, the simple interactive fiction I want to tell and reading some notes I made um, when I went to the East Coast Gaming Conference on romance and dialogue and role-playing games, uh, video games. I've also had, you know, a busy week of doctor's appointments and stuff, so not been uh, at the desk very much. But I did, I mentioned last week that I sent some words to my agent. I did hear back from him. Um, it's a, this is fun, on the right track, here's some notes about what's weak. And I uh, am kind of digesting that right now and wrote him back for some clarifications and uh, waiting for that. I've been doing the ridiculous thing of listening to, uh, listening to a genre that I don't really write. I would like to write, but I don't. And that's um, just rom-coms. I really like rom-coms. And every time I try to write one, it gets more complicated and science fiction-y. Which, there's nothing wrong with that, but I would like to challenge myself to write a non-science fiction rom-com. I mean, we're going to talk to James Sutter in the interview today. And he talks about moving from being a fantasy writer, because he's written fantasy novels, and also co-creator of a little thing called Pathfinder. And uh, his new book is... Dark Hearts, which is a gay YA rom-com. I don't know if it's calm. Romance. Definitely romance. But just reading one and not being fully satisfied with it um, has left me feeling weird and dissatisfied today. So hoping that I can get some words down the rest of this week. I think another part is I've had insomnia. So I'm, you know, falling asleep on the couch at... 10 p.m. and 4 p.m. at my desk, and then at 2 a.m. I'm wide awake. So I got some problems, but they're not terrible problems, but they're not, I'm not right a lot at this moment. I'm plotting a lot, but that's going to have to turn to something soon. So yeah, we've got the interview with James Sutter coming up. And I was just talking about what I was reading without actually saying it when I promised myself I was going to start talking about what I was reading. I'm almost done with James Sutter's uh, Dark Hearts, which we're talking to James today. And uh, I did just finish the audiobook of People We Meet on Vacation by Emily something. If you're new to the show, I'm terrible with names. I'm terrible with everybody's name. It's It's terrible. I've had off. I'm I'm a short fiction editor. I've had authors introduce themselves to me at cons, and I don't recognize their names until they tell me what story they wrote. And I'm like, "Oh right, we published that. That was awesome." Yeah, it's embarrassing, but it's just yeah. Anyway, the author's name is Emily Henry. She's kind of hot right now. I believe her latest book is Hell. 
This is on No. Of course somebody's doing their lawn. I don't know if we can hear that. I can hear it through my headphones. Anyway. Right. Her latest book is Happy Place. She's done Book Lovers and Beach Read, I think. Um and I've read Beach Read. And I'll be honest, it was it was I, I, I remember enjoying it and it was utterly forgettable. Um Right, she's done Happy Place, People We Meet on Vacation, Beach Read, Book Lovers, and a couple of others. Uh, but those are the big, they all have the same art style. They're the whole, like, big summer read rom-com things. And uh, I found myself a little dissatisfied with the end, and I'm not quite sure why. I think it was one of those, um, you know, the, the romance tropes, which is, we can't be together, and then... We get close to almost be together. And then there's one more reason why we can't be together. And then one of us must overcome that thing. And sometimes the last reason you can't be together is a little shaky. At least in my opinion. And I think this one might fall into that. And you know, she's a bestseller. It's a good book overall. I'm not hurting her sales, <laughs> really. I'm just trying to learn from these books. So yeah, um, I also just finished These Prisoning Hills by Christopher Rowe, which is a Tor.com novella. And it's a fascinating, like, there was an apocalyptic war with an AI who could modify the actual, you know, flora and fauna of the land around her. And she'd pretty much taken over a good part of the Appalachian Mountains, and it's about a woman dealing with that like 30 or 40 years later. I just finished that last night, so that was pretty good. Christopher Rowe's a good writer. I need to read more of his stuff. So yeah, that's what I'm reading. I wanted to talk a little bit about craft, but honestly, lately when it comes to writing, the only things on my mind are ADHD and how I'm handling it, frankly. And I don't like it, but I know it resonates with a lot of people. Right now, my problem is accepting that a lot of the problems I have are due to ADHD, but being upset that I can't do anything about it. Like, I'm not sure how to handle it. And specifically, I'm thinking of object permanence, which, you know, it feels like people with ADHD are kind of like six-month-olds. If we can't see it, it doesn't exist. And, and if you don't have it, then, you know, great for you. Awesome. But no, we're not like really like children. We, we understand that things exist, but we don't think about them. And I've talked about how I don't do bullet journaling and, and almost every single special planner thing I've ever tried to do has failed. And often the reason why it fails is I just don't think to do it. You know, I'll set it up, I'll be excited about it, and then the next day it's like I get up late, or I've got a headache, or I've got to get to uh, my focus mate meeting with my workout buddy, or, you know, I've just written, I couldn't find it, and so I wrote what I needed to do on the nearest piece of paper. And the object permanence thing is also why everywhere I go is a mess. I'm not proud of it, but it's like, I realized I'm afraid that if I don't have everything in front of me, I'm going to forget about it. No, I'm not afraid. That is what will happen. You know, it's, it's, I think I'm, see, this is the problem with recording and then losing it. I can't remember whether I talked about this in the lost recording or last week, but recently had my car detailed and took a whole bunch of stuff out of the car and forgot that I'd purchased a system to make everything neater in my back, in the back hatchback and because everything was neat and put away, I forgot I had it. And I don't like that. I don't, I don't know what to do about it. But it's like, people talk about how, you know, the mess is really distracting. And if you want to really focus on your writing, you need to clean up the mess. And I'm like, I feel like half of these things are security blankets. If I put them away, they're going to go away. And then I get sad. Just at the thought. It's not, it's not good. I, I don't know what to do. But back to writing. I think I'm going to try to um, challenge myself to write something outside of my genre. It's, I feel awkward writing about romance. I don't know. But I like reading it, so I feel like I should be able to write it, right? And I'm not saying I should be able to write it because it's easy. It's not easy. I have great respect for people who write in all genres. 
I got Julia Cameron's new book, which is interesting because she's been repurposing the artist's way many times. And I think some people are getting a little annoyed at that because she hasn't said a lot of new stuff in a while. And if you're not familiar with The Artist's Way, it's Julia Cameron's sort of method of creativity. It's a 12-week process. You, you know, you get the book and then you do one chapter a week. And she's got basic tools, which are morning pages. You write um, three pages longhand every morning. You go for walks. You take your artist self out for a date. Go to an art gallery or go to see a movie or do something that you haven't done or seen or just to sort of encourage your creative mind kind of thing. I've never been good at the artist dates, but I started doing the morning pages again. And for some reason, I feel like this time it's going to stick. I don't know why. And, and then each chapter goes into why you may be stifled create, creatively. And most of the time, her work talks about creativity in general. But her latest one is actually about writing. And it's about an actual project. So you're supposed, it's called Write for Life, and you're supposed to, it's a six-week program, and it's, you know, you work on your writing. And the new tool, Beyond Morning Pages and the Walk, is uh, you write on your project every day. And she recommends writing slow and steady, which again, <laughs> I feel like so many of these people with the self-help books don't actually understand ADHD. I mean, I barely understand it. I just thought I was weird or lazy or messy. But a lot of people with ADHD or other mental issues or physical issues can't write every day. Or when they do write, they have to write thousands and thousands of words at a time because they hit that flow state. Or they only have time for that. I take a lot of the artist's way with a grain of salt. Because while, yes, it is amazing. It's really, really useful. I won't lie. It has you go into a lot of whatever made you not believe in yourself and confront that. You know, teachers, parents, you know, people when you were seven saying something about your work. I got in trouble for drawing a lion when our, my fourth grade teacher was reading a lion, lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe to us. Also an ADHD thing. I had to occupy myself while I was listening to someone read. Ugh. Got in trouble for that. Not an artist, but I don't think I would have been a very good artist anyway because I'm not a visual person. But some of the time she has, you know, I want you to do this, you know, certain things on certain weeks. It, it feels like this, this would be great if I were taking a writing retreat and had nothing else to do. No job, no family, no anything else. And if I could only focus on my creativity, yeah, this would be doable. So I take it with a grain of salt, but I do recommend it. I, I think what got me back into it was uh, there's a woman doing... The Artist Way podcast, and it's not the official Artist Way podcast, but she's been doing it for like four years, and so I guess Julia Cameron's people haven't come down on her. So she started with The Artist Way, and then she just went straight into another book, and she's been doing, I don't know if she does it weekly, because I've just been listening to archives, and she hasn't really talked about the date, and I don't look too closely at when the podcast was posted, until it, get, it gets into... Um, a more recent, <laughs> I realized when she got to 2020, because she started talking about current events more than previous ones. But anyway, uh, she's apparently doing all Julia Cameron's books with her writing group. And she, interesting listening to her talk about her approach to things. And I think that's what got me back into it. So I'm kind of doing the, I'm checking out the Right for Life. I really, really want to finish Finding Water. I really do which is her mid-career sort of program. So I'm going to be checking those out. But I did the morning pages. I Another thing with the morning pages is uh, I realized I was not being honest in them. That is because of uh, a family member read my diary when I was a kid and then took me to a psychiatrist. After that breach of trust, it's hard to want to write anything down. And it's not even... I don't trust individual people. It's not like I honestly think that someone's going to, like a guest or even a member of my own family, will come across my notebook and read it. I don't think that. I just, when it's time to write stuff down, I'll leave stuff out or not talk about my innermost thoughts and feelings. Because the last time I did that, I got sent to a doctor. Oh, boy. 
And so in acknowledging that, I'm trying not only to do this again, but also to be honest. And if I ever catch myself lying, I will try to say, nope, I'm lying. Here's what's really going on in my head. But I am glad to be podcasting on a regular basis. I'm going to try real hard. I, I, like I said, I got frustrated and I'm kind of got that feeling of I had a very productive week last week and felt very good about my ambitions with podcasting and writing. Um, and then this week it's like had to go to the doctor and had insomnia and suddenly it's Wednesday afternoon and I'm trying to get this written with the goal of producing and posting three podcasts in the next two days. And also, by the way, I got to write. But every day is a new struggle. And all I can do is what I can do right now. And that sounds like a kind of circular thinking, but it actually helps me. That's, that's my new mantra or saying. All I can do is what I can do right now. Because it makes me not think about the future and it makes me not worry about whatever I was doing or not doing in the past. What can I do right now? It's helping me. Maybe it'll help you. And maybe you can find your own mantra or saying, affirmation, something to get you through the day. Who knows? But we're going to talk to James L. Sutter, game designer and YA romance writer. I wanted to do a live interview with James Sutter, a good friend of mine and game designer and author of Dark Heart's new YA novella Ooh. novel. Why do you say novella? It's clearly <laughs> very thick book. It's way too thick for a novella. Yeah, it's I know. It's even a little thick for YA. My publisher was like, can you get this any smaller? And I was like, honestly, no. Oh, really? Like, wow. How many words well, is it? It's not that many. It's like uh, maybe 85,000. That's not... Um, that's not Right? That's the thing. I'm coming from adult science fiction and fantasy where everybody's like, this is 250K. And the publisher's like, fine. Yeah. But in YA, they're kind of like, ooh, like, can you, more than 80,000? Like, that's a lot. And wow. I'm like, that's not that much. But we'll see. My next YA book is currently sitting at 100. So we'll see if oh everybody my. has a Same heart publisher? attack. Same publisher? Same publisher. So I think they're going to want it shrunk. But, you know, it was funny, though, because with uh, this one, I talked to my editor and they were like, you, we really need you to shrink this down. And I was like, cool, just give me some guidance. Like, what do you think can be cut? And she was like, give me a couple days. <laughs> My editor like read through it again and came back and was like, honestly, there's like one party scene that you could shrink by like a couple pages, but otherwise, yeah, just leave it all in there. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's sort of no extraneous stuff. And I was like, oh, well, that's really gratifying. Yeah, yeah. Um, with my latest book, I had... Um... I usually write very spare, so my mm. rewrites are always larger. And gotcha. I in my the first big rewrite I had to do, I added about twenty five thousand words. Wow! And when the editor, I think when this next edit came around, she's like, "Yeah, don't do too many more words." And I'm like, "Well, you know, it's like at one twenty five now, right?" And she's like, "I did not know that." So apparently, <laughs> you didn't bog it down. So. <laughs> <laughs> good good i mean that's that's sort of how i feel and i understand like i have been an editor i've worked at publishers i understand that longer books do in fact cut into margins they cause issues with printing like i get it but at the same time just as a reader and as a writer i feel like stories should be the length they need to be and so if you're telling me to cut it down because it's bloated and it's feeling like it's taking a long time i have zero problem with that but when somebody's just got an arbitrary number i'm like really i mean how much can can i just can we just make those extra three cents that it's going to cost to add another signature to the book like can we figure out another way to deal with that because i think the story needs to be this long I did not say that. I did not offer to pay for the extra pages because my agent would probably kill me <laughs> but in my heart that is how i feel the nerds listening anyway is, are probably know you best from your being the co-creator of Pathfinder. Just yeah. a little game like that. Um, <laughs> just that little thing. And uh, so what, what, what really made me excited was uh, I, I didn't know James that well, but we've seen each other at cons and he was always very nice. And then um, I brought up the fact that, that when he was talking about sort of doing a pivot for you've writ written other novels but this is like your first ya romance yeah. thing right this is a and, big and step contemporary out. this is my first non-fantasy non-science fiction thing yeah so um i suggest i i'm like you know what i'd like to ask you some questions just on a personal level and james is like cool and we sat down and had like a zoom call 
which is like just a phone call for no reason other than to just like <laughs> yeah. bounce some ideas off of each other. I'm like, we don't do that anymore very much, do we? It's true. The idea of just calling somebody up. But I figured we had played that, um, not Space Alert, but the other one, The Captain is Dead. We mm. played that at uh, Confusion together one time. And yes. I feel like once you've once you've survived in space together, like what's a phone call? That's fine. That's true. So, <laughs> um, you know, we talked about doing various things and um, really wanted to get James on to talk about moving from all the RPG stuff you've done to Dark Hearts. So let's, let's talk about Dark Hearts first, because it's very cool. No. Yeah. yeah. So Dark Hearts is a queer contemporary young adult romance all about falling in love with the boy who stole your chance to be a rock star. So literally. the literally. So the idea is the main character David when he was in middle school, he formed a band with his best friends um and they did all right for themselves, but then, you know, egos got big and he stormed out. And then the band got huge without him. So now he's 17. He's stuck in high school being a normal kid while his former best friends are traveling the world being pop stars. But when, you know, obviously he's very bitter about that. But when tragedy throws him and the lead singer back into contact, he starts to remember all the things that made him and uh, the singer friends in the first place. And also discovers that underneath that sort of frenemy status... Uh, maybe he actually really likes this guy, which is a huge surprise to him because he's always thought he's straight, but now there's definitely this spark of romance between them. And so as they start exploring that and sort of secretly dating, he also starts to think, oh, well, maybe this is my chance not just at love, but to get back into the band and get the fame and fortune I've been denied. But as you can imagine, uh, trying to use one's romantic partner to further your own... <laughs> You know, ambitions. Maybe not the greatest relationship dynamic. Yeah, you just um, want them to offer to help you rather than... Yeah. yeah. So it uh, it gets very messy. Um, but it is, despite some, you know, some heavier themes, like it is a very light, funny, you know, comic, sort of, sort of rom-com kind of story. And I... One thing that I really like about it that I've sort of realized the more I talk to people who have read it is I think that it's a very realistic romance in that, you know, these boys aren't idealized, you know, they're, it's a romance and like, you can definitely fall for, uh, for the love story, but at the same time, they're 17. So they are sweaty and horny and awkward and bad <laughs> at communicating. And, you know, all of those things that I remember from being a 17 year old boy. Uh, so that's all in there. And a lot of it is also, I mean, to be frank, a lot of it pulls from my own life. And, you know, while I never, you know, fell in love with a international pop star, <laughs> um, I did, you know, when I was, yeah, when I was 15, I made a punk band. We did all right for ourselves. Um, but I really can remember that feeling of being, you know, 18 and watching bands younger than me start to get signed and blow up and feeling like, well, I'm a failure. Like I'm, I'm a has been. If I haven't made it by the end of high school, <laughs> then I'm just done. Right? Which, which oh, wow. sounds silly to us now, but I think a lot of kids are walking around with that. Whether it's you know kids who expect to be sports stars or child actors or musicians or whatever, or influencer, got, or TikTok stars, or yeah, yeah, we've all sort of got this idea that we're gonna hit it big right out of the gate, and when we don't it can cause a real identity crisis. And mm -hmm. for me, especially once my first band broke up, I was like, I don't know who I am if I'm not a future rock star. You know, like if I'm not on that path, I don't know wh what my identity is. And then you tie that in also with, you know, it's also a coming out story in that David's realizing he's bisexual and it mirrors in a lot of ways my own, you know, coming out story. It took me a few years longer, but uh, just that question of, okay, what do you do when you thought you knew who you were, but now the labels you were using for yourself no longer apply? So how do you how do you find who you are when the persona you've been living uh, no longer fits? So that's kind of, uh, that's sort of Dark Hearts in a nutshell. Excellent. So I'm probably, okay, I'm definitely projecting here, but <laughs> whenever I get an idea that is 
more fitting in a contemporary setting, for some reason my brain always tries to grab onto what sort of speculative fiction can I put in this. Oh, yeah. And, that, and that's partly to make me excited, because I was always a voracious reader as a kid, but I never thought I could write until I read science fiction. And I'm like, oh, that's right. what I want to do. And so I'm just projecting on you, like, you you created Pathfinder. You know, it's like... <laughs> well, I, how, there how were a few you, of us, but yeah, I no, created Pathfinder and Starfinder. It. I've yeah. heard. I've heard you single-handedly did it. You wrote every single word yourself, did all the art. I just pulled it directly out of my brain, like <laughs> Zeus. Like, yeah, no. But still, <laughs> but, you, you've got major major fantasy and science fiction street cred and you decided to go completely contemporary with this and did you have a problem with that starting out did you struggle with that like i inevitably will do if i ever try to do that but or do you find it easy uh both um (laughs) i knew it was strategically speaking a terrible idea Right, because I had spent, you know, I've spent almost 20 years in the game industry. Uh, I stepped down as creative director of Starfinder a couple years ago, and so I've been a full-time writer ever since, focusing on novels and stuff, but I still thought of myself as a science fiction and fantasy guy. You know, everything, all my short stories are speculative fiction and horror, you know, all of the comics I've done, all the video games, all the game work, it's always been science fiction and fantasy, But during the pandemic, I was reading a lot of young adult contemporary romance, uh, kind of just as an escape, Um, A, because I was a little bit burned out, but B, the thing that I love about rom-coms especially is the contemporary stuff, it's all about voice and character. You know, there's no, the the stakes are usually very low in that it's just, it's not like the world's going to blow up. It's just, do these characters get together? And then if it's set in the real world, there's not a bunch of world building and stuff. You know, there's not magic systems and monsters. And so you really have to just live or die based on voice and character. And that was so appealing to me um, in what I was reading. And I have this thing where I kind of can't fall in love with an art form without wanting to try it myself, you mm-hmm. know, which is how I'm, I'm always bouncing around. It's like, well, I'm going to play in a metalcore band. Well, what about some musical theater? Maybe I could write a play, you know, like it just, I'm all over the place. Uh, and so in this instance, I was in the middle of a big dystopian, like science fiction thing uh, that my agent was waiting for, you know, my, <laughs> my agent at the time, who was a science fiction fantasy agent. Uh, she was like, cool, write that. And then I woke up one day and I was, reading on wikipedia about stuart sutcliffe who was the original bassist for the beatles and then he quit right before they got huge and i was like what would that feel like to leave a band and then watch them get immortal and then because i was also reading a bunch of young adult contemporary romance i was like and then what if they fell in love (laughs) and i just like immediately leapt out of bed and typed out the first couple chapters But the whole second chapter is basically just me talking about the experience of being an underage musician in Seattle. It's just, I mean, it's almost an essay just in the voice of the narrator, which, spoiler, we got a lot in common. Um, (laughs) And so, uh, you know, I wrote that and then I sort of sat back, you know, after two hours or whatever and looked at it and went, hey, this doesn't make any sense for me to write. I have no idea if I can do this, but this was fun. Like, this is... There's a feeling that I get occasionally when the writing is really, when I've really stumbled onto something, when it just feels right. And this had that spark that I hadn't had recently. So I was like, I just need to follow this. And I didn't tell my agent about it until I was mostly done. You know, I spent a couple, I spent like four or five months just being like, do, do, do. Um, Cause I was worried she'd be like, what are you doing? Why mm-hmm. did you do this? Um, and lo and behold, when I gave her the book, I was like, Hey, this is what I wrote. She was like, okay, I'll read it. And then she came back and was like, this isn't my jam. This isn't what I do. I don't like, maybe it's competently done, but I don't get it. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And so then, I mean, she, she was very nice about it. She was very nice. Um, and she did very generously say like, if you want to find a young adult agent, um, to represent that side of your career, uh, that's fine. Um, which is actually, which is a very nice thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, I did, and I spent the next seven months looking for a young adult agent, um, which was my third agent search, uh, because I'd been through 
that I was already on my second agent at the time. So I did another agent search and this one was actually the hardest. Wow. Like, you know, I think my first agent search, I think I went through like seven or eight agents before getting an, an offer of rep. Uh, or maybe, maybe the first time it was like a, a dozen or something. The second time it was only a couple. Um, and then this time it was like 30 rejections or something straight off the bat. Ouch. And part of it was because I was looking for somebody who was willing to be, uh, for lack of a better term, non-monogamous. Like most, <laughs> most agents want to control your whole career. Yeah. Never mind that yeah. they have plenty of clients, right? Like sure, they want sure. you to be just with them. Um, but so I was doing this and I was actually getting quite discouraged uh, because like half the agents would just say, I don't share. And then the other half were legitimately just not vibing with the book. And so, you know, it was pretty worrisome. And then randomly, I was talking to a young adult author friend of mine, uh, Amy Kaufman, and she was saying, uh, I, I was complaining about this. And she was like, oh, well, why don't you try my agent? I said, well, like, your agent is literally my top choice on the, you know, I've got my stack ranked list of 200 agents or whatever that I've researched, because that's that is the sort of person I am. Like, there will be an Excel spreadsheet in there. Um, and I was like, well, I would love to, but like, he's been close to, you know, queries forever. She was like, well, let me see. Let me just see if he's interested. Um, so she sent him, she asked if he was interested. Uh, he got back to her immediately and said, sure. Uh, he read the book, offered representation like two weeks later. And then sold the book like two weeks after that. Wow. So it was just this sudden whirlwind of just like, all right, let's go. Um, and it turns out like he's actually now my sole agent, Josh Adams at Adams Literary. Mm -hmm. And I could not be happier. You know, like my both of my previous agents were, you know, they were good agents. They're objectively very successful. They're very nice people. But Josh and I just click. And it was so nice to have that that feeling of like, oh, we're 100% on the same page here, both in terms of like what we like and how to, how we want to do things. And so, uh, yeah. And then it's just, it's been phenomenal. You know, that was 18 months ago yeah. uh, between the, the purchase and now the book coming out, but it's been, it's been a blast. It's been a wild ride. That's very cool. So um, I got it. You know, I, I admire you for all the creative achievements you've gotten but just your tenacity at this point <laughs> in your career is really impressive because i was i realized personally i'm having trouble just trying to branch out and do something new because i've just been doing creative i'm like i'm not saying i'm incredibly uh, haven't achieved a ton but it's like i've been doing this totally for so have, long yeah. Like the idea of what you did, which is go out and hunt for an agent for months and like, you know, take a step into a new career that, that you had zero in, uh, experience Starting in. at the bottom again. Yeah. I really did. But yeah. it's like, academically, I know that would be the next step, except that how did you not give up <laughs> <laughs> well so i have i have always said that the thing you need in, to succeed in this industry is hubris and humility you need enough humility to listen and take it in when somebody's got legitimate criticism of your work yeah um because that's how you improve but you got to have the hubris to say no nah, i think i can i think i can do that right like you know people always say um there's the thing that people say online where it's like you know, God grant me the confidence of a mediocre white man. Mm -hmm. um, as a mediocre white man, it's great. Like, you're not <laughs> wrong. Like, it's... A <laughs> and so, like, I've kind of always just in the back of my head, like, I've got plenty of self-confidence issues, but there's always just been a part that's like, well, no, screw it. Like, I, I can do I, I can do that. Like, I'm not the best, but, like, I might be good enough, you know? And I think that's... Uh, maybe part of it is just working in publishing for so long I've seen that it's not, you don't have to be the absolute best to have a career in publishing. Mm -hmm. And so like, I never, like, I'm very proud of my work, but I never think like, oh, I am the best writer. I just think like, I think I can get over that bar. You know, I think I can hop over that hurdle. Um, because I mean, and this ties into music as well. Like 
I, it's not the most talented bands that succeed. It's the bands that don't break up. Yeah. And so that's sort of how I feel as a writer, where it's just like, I'm just going to keep beating my head against the wall and eventually the wall will come down or I'll at least have given it my best shot, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and also from being an editor, you know, the only reason I wrote a novel the first time I'd always wanted to write a novel, but I'd always been scared to because novels are these huge things. And I had such a, you know, every novelist was a God to me. Yeah. Um, just the idea that you could sit down and write a book. Um, but then when I started working, uh, you know, so when I was at Paizo um, for the 13 years that I was there, I both, you know, did a lot of writing and game design on Pathfinder and Starfinder. And eventually I was the creative director of Starfinder, sort of creating that game. But I was also the executive editor of the Pathfinder Tales novel line, which was our series of tie in novels. We did maybe 40 of them. Um, and I was the, the guy in charge of all that, uh, you know, commissioning authors. Uh, and then working with them from pitch all the way through the final publication. And so it was hugely enlightening for me to see sort of these authors who were very talented and established going through the same outline process, you know, struggling with their pitches, struggling with characters and realizing that like, oh, every great work of art like starts out as a pile of garbage. Mm -hmm. And like, I can make a pile of garbage. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and I, remember, I, remember, I can't remember who exactly somebody was saying the first time I ever talked at Clarion, you know, I think I said something along the lines of like a lot of the you know writing that's out there that's successful just isn't that great. And you can be not that great, too. You know, <laughs> and like mm -hmm. I find that deeply inspiring, you know, because it lets me get past the uh, the perfectionism into just making stuff right. Having that punk rock aesthetic of yeah, I'm not the best at my instrument, but like I made a thing and I'm going to play it for you and maybe you'll resonate with it because mm -hmm. sometimes that's enough. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I wish that on everybody. Like if you're, if you're out there feeling nervous about putting your work out there, just, just do it. Because even if it isn't the best, like spoiler, it's probably not the best. Yeah. Like none of us is, none of us is the best. But there might be something in there that someone really resonates with because it carries a piece of you and it might touch a piece of them. So just put it out there, even if it's, you know, three chords, like that's that's what you've got to offer. It was a very weird experience pivoting um, because because I, I in some ways I thought that it would help more and it absolutely did help. Like the only reason I had, you know, the only reason I can say, oh, when I was talking to my friend, New York Times bestselling author Amy Kaufman, right, like, was because we had met because she liked Starfinder and, like, we we ended up chatting, right? You know, I, like, my connections from being in the industry absolutely did help, but it wasn't what I thought it would be, which is, oh, this guy has all this experience, let's give him a book deal. You know, the YA world was very much like, oh, what is... What is Pathfinder and Starfinder? Like, we've never heard of this before. And so it didn't really, like, they were, they saw it as a pleasant add-on, but it did not get me a book deal or anything. Like, yeah. that was just the book, um, which in some ways is really reassuring, because that means that, like, it's not just about who you know. It's yeah. not just about the connections. It's about the book. And you're not a uh, one-trick pony. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Um, and then, of course, it was also shocking to realize there's a lot more money in <laughs> YA romance than there is in oh, yeah. science fiction, fantasy, or especially in gaming tie-in, you know? Yeah. So suddenly it was like, oh, oh, this is 10 times more than you know, yeah. I was making in this other field. Yeah. Uh, that was a nice surprise and is the reason why I am now primarily a contemporary young adult romance author. Have you gotten into the uh, YA romance uh, community? I've heard it's well, interesting. Also, well, so bloodthirsty. Yes and no. Um, I'm I'm brand new to it, and I didn't. You know, a lot of people have been like, "Oh, well, like, don't you hang out with your debut debut group?" And I'm sort of always like, "What? What do you mean, my debut group?" Apparently, a lot of authors who debut together in the same year, they all like hang out in the same slacks and discords. Uh, wow, really? Nobody apparently it's a big thing. I didn't know. Nobody invited me. Um <laughs> but like I also I also already have my own slacks, right? Yeah. Like you know, I've got a lot of 
science fiction fantasy authors that I've known for 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, and so I'm a little bit of an outsider there. But that said, I went to uh, the Texas Librarians Association a couple months ago to sort of uh, promote Dark Hearts. And the other young adult authors there were amazing. Like I made so many friends. Everybody was so nice. And so, uh, and young adult publishing has everybody in public, the publishing side has been incredible. So I have heard from a lot of people that young adult can be very bloodthirsty, uh, especially online that, you know, that you do something wrong and the mob will come for you. Yeah. And that may be well be true. They might just not have gotten to whatever part of my book yet will make the mob come for me. <laughs> but at the same time, like I've gotten so much love from readers and reviewers. Uh, and in, in part, that might also be because like it is a queer love story and there's a lot of people looking for queer love stories right now. So like maybe I'm getting a little bit of a pass, but everybody's just been really nice. Like mm -hmm. it's been a lovely experience. That's awesome. So Can what? I say one thing that Please. is crazy, though? Please. Um, not crazy. Sorry. Bad word choice. Something that surprised me uh, is, you know, I thought that people would be mad at me for, like, the gay sexual content or the swearing or, you know, whatever. But actually, the thing that the most people have cited in reviews that made them really mad is I have one passing reference to Harry Potter in the book. <gasps> oh! Um, at some point, I wow. just say, like, I literally just have a character say Wingardium Leviosa, um, which I'm like, whatever, like, that's one of, that's a reference to one of the most popular media properties of all time. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people were really, you know, triggered by that, which I did not see coming. Wow. Um, and of course, that's not my intention, right? But uh, I was very surprised by that. So um, even though, actually, to be fair... I was warned by a friend that was like, you should not mention Harry Potter in any context. And I was like, well, of course, I'm not going to like, you know, J.K. Rowling sucks. I'm not going to come out and have a character be like, Harry Potter's so great. Yeah. Um, but also, like, I sort of figured, well, there are a lot of people in the world who suck. And I still reference them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, it's not going to mention you know the gop for instance right like you know like but uh but so i didn't realize what a big deal it was until i saw the reviews starting to come out and then i went ah okay lesson learned like wow i, I didn't know really... it was getting that bad i knew people were getting crap for playing the latest video game that came out right but I sure yeah that even like a reference got yeah and angry. right like i i totally get that if you're somebody who's like, look, this discourse has been going on for years. Why are you? Why is anybody mentioning this? Pro you know, this property anymore? Um, I totally get it, but I think it's one of those things where we forget in our ver various online sub communities that not everybody is at the same point in the conversation that we are. Mm -hmm. Right. So it really is possible to just step in a hole that you didn't know was there like and it and have it look intentional to people that are like how could you not know about the hole you know right and like it's your job to know about the hole and that's true but there are there are traps everywhere so anyway that was that was a thing that i learned uh if you're listening to this sorry <laughs> like please <laughs> please don't be mad at me um because now i know that that's a thing yeah yeah it's interesting. Uh, Daniel in chat says people still reference um, Cthulhu, sure, and other right? Lovecraftian like... things, and that dude sucked. I think. I think one of the things <clears throat> with the lady in Scotland, as I call her, um, is that she's still currently causing harm. Right. So she's actively causing harm now, and I think that's why a lot of people have just been, nope, hands off. And, um, but yeah, I. I right. Didn't I? I wouldn't have expected that either. So right. I'm, well, I'm sorry you've gotten that. But oh, you know, it's not nobody's nobody's come after me, right? Mm -hmm. Like, which I appreciate. But like, I do see it pop up in reviews, uh, and it's one of those things where it's like, oh, this actually makes a difference to people. That's good to know. And like, whether you agree or not, it's useful to know where your audience is at, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes you can make a deliberate choice to, you know. I I think whatever thing is whatever issue you've got that 
sometimes you can say, I want to poke this bear because I think it's important that somebody poke this bear, but uh, it's still useful and like behooves you to know what the bears are, right? So that if you're doing it, you're doing it intentionally, right? Because there's definitely stuff that I say in the book that is about sexuality and, uh, you know, labels and sexual identity that, and it, when I say I say it, I mean, I have characters say it, that I'm sure will not resonate for people uh but i felt like it was important to say it anyway because it represents my experience mm -hmm. and i think we all you're never going to accurately represent everybody's experience especially everybody's experience around a an identity so you know you're you're going to have to pick your battles but it's it's much better if you know exactly why you're doing it right you know for for me there was a lot that i wanted to say about the feeling of being, you know, by the like, am I bot am I queer enough? You know, that sort of thing. Where I'd written an essay years ago for Queers Destroy Science Fiction, the light speed issue, that was called Halfway in the Pool, which was all about the feeling of being a bi guy and wondering, do I actually can I claim the queer label? Like do I actually belong in these spaces? Because, you know, I haven't had to fight and suffer in the same way that some of my gay friends have. And also, isn't that messed up that there's this temptation to say you're not really gay unless you've suffered for it? Like, mm -hmm. that sucks. Like, I don't want that to be the way the world is. Yeah. And so, uh, like, I've I've come to a place of being comfortable saying, like, yeah, like, I'm a queer guy. That's a label that I can claim and that's fine. And, but I think that's, it took me a long journey to get there. So in the book, I have the character get there a lot faster <laughs> than I did, which yeah. would have been very useful when I was 17. So I hope somebody else uh, can use this as a cheat code in their own brain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one more question about the, the hot topic. Yeah. Do you think it was, do you think that is going to be something any author is called out for or is because your book is by and for the queer community or oh, by and about? Talking, talking about the wizard school? Yeah. And and um, so that's specifically the harm that, that she's done towards that group. Or do you think anybody's hating any reference to it these days? Oh, I mean, I think, to be clear, I think that most most people who are not on Twitter, most people are not queer. Um, most people are not aware of any of the discourse that's happening. Like, it's very easy online to feel like everybody's involved in the discourse and you mm -hmm. forget that, like, 90% of the country has no idea that there's any discussion of any of this, right? And so, like, is everybody having a problem with this? No. Is everybody online in specific sub communities like having a problem with this? Yeah. And like if you're writing a book for those communities in particular, like I do think if you were writing a adult romance, a straight adult romance aimed at a totally different audience uh, and you mentioned Harry Potter, would people w would you catch a bunch of flack for it? Probably not, because that demographic isn't in that conversation. But yeah. when you're writing queer young adult romance, like the people who are up on these issues are like young queer people online. And so that's where it's really good to know, like I was saying, like know where your audience is at, know their concerns, know what they like, know what they don't like. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think. I think those are the spaces that are being a, the people are being a little bit more conscious of the issue. Um, but again, right. Like, I, I don't know that anybody's getting, you know, getting canceled for it. It's just yeah. be aware of the and and also take online criticism. Like, I think people land themselves in trouble. And in fact, I think this is kind of what like turned uh, she who will not be named into such a jerk is like, I think that it's very tempting when somebody online says, you hurt me. Um, I think it is very tempting to go back and say, well, you're hurting me by telling me that you hurt me. Mm -hmm. And so now you're my enemy. And like to, you know, people back themselves into these corners yeah. where they be, 
become jerks out of defensiveness because that's easier than dealing with a sense of guilt. And so I think uh, that's something you always got to be mindful of and also be like, you know, so if somebody it's like a Goodreads review, right? Like somebody gives you a one star Goodreads review and says, I didn't like about X about the book. OK, yeah. that's not for you. That's a that's a reflection of their interior life. Like there's lots of things that I don't like or that make me uncomfortable. It doesn't necessarily mean that that I'm attacking the creator. I'm just right. saying this didn't work for me. So I think, uh, <laughs> you know, the real lesson here is just uh, step back from <laughs> the keyboard on everything, yeah. right? Like on Twitter, on all those things. Like I think a lot of authors land themselves in trouble by by wanting to fight for their honor, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ah, dude, just, you know, listen or don't. But if you're going to listen to what people say, try to take it in the spirit of like, that is a thing that I now know about my audience. Like, maybe that's a thing that I, maybe that's a thing that I should apologize for or that I should do differently. Maybe it's not, but like, you don't have to debate everybody. Yeah. Anyway, we went like way off course and I'm probably just like digging holes for myself all over the place. But well, I mean, I don't think so. I think you're you're bringing bringing up something that's you know, a viable viable? I don't think it's the right word. But anyway, it, it's it's a real issue and I'm sorry you've you've gotten dinged for that, but I'm glad you haven't had like the a mob come oh, after you. No, no. I mean, for the most part like everyone has been universally lovely about these books and even the people who are like seriously uh for the most part like they're still giving the book good reviews right mm -hmm. they're just saying this is a this is a problem right so uh this, that's another good lesson of like see the forest for the trees right yeah. like you got one bad review and a bunch of good ones you're doing fine yeah my it's, it's been my opinion that um the way people if if the people who respond to your book are not gradually forming a bell curve you're doing something wrong you're gonna have people who love it and you're gonna have people who hate it and you're gonna have a whole bunch of people in the middle and, right right and it's like if you don't get your one star reviews then your bell curve is off and you're probably not reaching enough people right so um i still well, don't like to read them <laughs> but yeah. the fact that they're there i mean i am no different than any other author in the world anybody right well, and the thing that I try to also remember is like something like Goodreads, people review very differently, right? You know, it's like when you're on Amazon and you're trying to buy, you know, a suction cup towel rack or whatever, you know, and you uh, you look at the reviews, anything less than five stars is like, well, what is wrong with this piece of junk? Yeah. You know, and you're looking for all the things that are like that. But then you go on Goodreads and there will be a million reviews that say this book literally changed my life. Uh, I was in a dark place and this book saved me four stars out of five. Yeah. Right? You know, <laughs> and like that, you yeah. find that all the time. Cause it's just, people are saving five stars. Like, I, I often am like, what are they saving five? Stars? Is it like the Bible is the only five star book in your life? Like, mm -hmm. what is it <laughs> like? Uh, but that's just the way people review. And so a thing that I've started trying to do for my own mental health is a don't look at Goodreads. But B, when you look at Goodreads, because you're bad at following your own advice, um, <laughs> look at the sort of three and up, yeah. right? You know, because if I look at three and up, I see, okay, like 94% of people like liked this book. They liked it at least three stars means they liked it, mm -hmm. right? And even if they aren't all five stars, like you can't be a straight A student when your work is in the world in general. Like, it's yeah. just not going to happen. You will never be the prettiest. Um, and so, like, that idea of, like, oh, most people thought I did good enough. Mm -hmm. That's great. They had a good time, and, like, that's what matters. Yeah. Uh, Daniel says, uh, were there any elements of creating RPGs that benefited the writing of your novel? Um, let's see. I mean... In some ways, it was really a vacation from that. But I think a lot of... And of course, like most of the advantage that I got from a career in the RPG industry was just writing a ton of words. You know, right, spending a lot of time being creative on, the command, on command, being a freelancer. You know, the ability to say, I need to sit down and write a thousand words on X in the next hour. Mm -hmm. Go. 
Um, but in terms of specific techniques, I think the biggest thing was thinking in terms think so it's set in Seattle, which is where I live. Um, and that was very fun because it, especially during the pandemic, allowed me to have the characters visit a lot of my favorite spots that I wasn't able to visit. So Excellent. it's like, they're going to go to my favorite restaurants, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but I also tried to think about it the same way I think about writing in a fantasy city, you know? So I've got this real city, but like, if I were to write a novel, like a Pathfinder novel set in a fantasy location, I would go through the source book and say, okay, what are the coolest locations? What are, you know, where do I, where would be the most, like dramatic place for a fight scene where would be the most dramatic place for another thing um and then i tried to take the same approach with seattle except instead of fight scenes it was like dates what would the <laughs> most interesting date the two 17 year olds could go on be you know mm -hmm. and so i would find these locations that felt very seattle and also felt uh just like sort of punk and exciting and i think that worked out pretty well i think it made it feel very much of the place. Like I, I had a number of people now say this book feels very Northwest, mm -hmm. uh, which is, which feels really good to me. Like that's a good compliment. Cause like this was my love letter to the city. Very cool. Um, so I know that you're also working on a comic series. Um, I, yeah. you know, you and I talked about just branching out in the middle of your career and doing lots of different stuff. And, um, that the comic stuff's very exciting. So what can you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm writing the new, uh, it's the first ever Starfinder comic series. So it's based on that game. Um, and I had written a number of Pathfinder comics for Dynamite and Paizo back in the day. Um, and I had always wanted to do Starfinder as well, because like, obviously, having been the creative director on that game, you know, putting a bunch of myself into the game's creation and leading that team, uh, you know, I, I love the setting desperately and I love the characters. And so when they finally said, OK, we're going to do a comic book series, I was really gratified that they picked me to write it. Um, but yeah, it's uh, the first uh, story arc is five issues. And the first issue comes out later this month um, in June for people listening later. And uh, it features the iconic characters who are... Um, when I say the iconics, like we have certain characters that pop up in the illustrations of our uh, rule books over and over again, because there's one for each playable class and species. And so that's sort of a way for uh, we created them as a, as artist reference, basically. But then the, the players started noticing them popping up again and again in the illustrations. And people were like, well, what's that guy's story? And mm -hmm. so we ended up making them sort of the main characters of the setting. Uh, but the story is all about um this you know starship crew of sort of mercenaries who are hired by a essentially robot angel to go bring faster than light technology to a previously uncontacted world but of course there are a previously uncontacted world is ripe with opportunities for exploitation and so they're uh in the first issue they're kind of racing against evil forces to try and get there first and help out this society and so it was really fun. It's very much sort of an action comedy kind of thing. It's got that 80s vibe where like, yeah, there's big explosions, but also there's a lot of banter, a lot of... Um, and because I'd been writing romance, there's a lot of character arc and a lot of interpersonal relationships that I really tried to put in there because I I feel like, you know, comics, everybody thinks of the whiz bang, you know, punching and shooting. But when you think about what really makes characters you know, comics stick, it's the characters, right? You like Wolverine because he is grumpy and paternal. And, you know, and you like Magneto because he's makes some good points. You know, he's the villain, but you kind of, you kind of vibe with it. Yeah. Um, and so I was really trying to do the same thing with these characters where like, they're at once, you know, iconic. They are who they are, but even in just this first series, they're growing and they've, they're, really thinking through who they are and why they're that way. So anyway, the first issue comes out uh, later this month, or uh, depending on when people are listening to this or are watching this in the stream, there's also a Kickstarter right now to just order the whole hardcover collection. So the first five issues will be combined into a single hardcover, and that's going to... Uh, you can You can sign up for that right now, and then when the series is done, they'll just send it to you. 
Um, so either way, and also there is, I should note, there is also game content in every issue, which is... Oh, a, really? Sort of, yeah, it's a fun thing they do. Um, and like, And they did the same thing with the Pathfinder comics, where the last couple of pages of the book will be new gear and character options and monsters and things like that that are inspired by the story. And and vice versa, actually. You know, there were some spaces where they said, hey, we have this new thing we'd really like to showcase. Could you work it into the story? Um, and so it was, there was a nice back and forth there. It was actually a really fun working relationship, especially because since I was the original creative director, mm-hmm. um, Paizo was kind of like, eh, James knows what he's doing. Like, they still approved everything, but they were like, go, you know, we trust you. Go, mm-hmm. like, give us something cool. And so there was a lot of freedom to really tell the story i wanted to tell which was nice excellent that's always got to be a good feeling um i put the link to the kickstarter in the chat and great well there's only four days to go i don't know if this podcast is going to get up in time to Uh, help you don't worry about that then but that'll be a if you're watching the uh the stream live that that is an option but it it is funded so you know it's going to happen so if you're interested then you can go check it out you could probably find it in your gaming or comic stores oh yeah 100 percent. so congratulations for the uh funding oh thank you yeah yeah it's one of those honestly because i knew that like that comic will be okay like i i had no question that that was going to go and that's sort of paizo and dynamite's thing i you know i've been helping where i can but really i've been focused on dark hearts because yeah. that's the one where it's like that's me that's <laughs> my future rests in a lot of ways on this book because you know we talk about debut culture and yeah we all kind of hate it but it's all really true so i've been hustling really hard uh which i i recommend if anybody's listening and has a debut coming up like i i love my publishers i love their publicity departments but nobody's ever going to work as hard for your book as you do so like you gotta just give it everything you got like i've arranged probably 30 to 40 interviews and podcasts and things like that wow. just for myself for this month right <laughs> um because because you gotta give it everything you've got. Yeah. Wow. I might be contacting you in October to to start planning out my launch in November. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Right. It's I mean, it's hard to know. It's a it's a really hard thing that we don't talk that much in this industry about. But knowing where your responsibilities as an author end, right? Like you know, obviously, if you're self pub, it's all on you to market your book. But if you're trad pub, it's you know, it's not all on you. But it's still on you, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's and it's hard to know what's going to actually move the needle. But I, I basically just said to myself, like, look, I don't know how much all of this matters, but I know that if I don't do it, I'm always going to wonder. Yeah. So instead, I'm just going to run as hard as I can for a couple of months. And yeah, at least I'll know I gave it my best. Yeah. Um, we got a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, Catwood please. asks, any other recommendations other than arranging podcasts? Oh, I guess for, for promotion. Debut promo. Um, let's see. Uh, I would say go through uh, your Twitter mutuals list and see if anybody like has podcasts, YouTube, Twitch, uh, a website where they write stuff, a blog. Um, and then just ping them and say like hey we follow each other you're at least like that (laughs) you at least know who i am Mm -hmm. um are you would you be interested in having me on sometime to talk about stuff you know um also you could hit up your local media like newspapers and radio and things like that um even if it feels like a long shot you never know like for instance i just did an interview that'll be out i think soon with uh the Seattle Gay News, which is a newspaper that's been around for a long time, that's specifically queer content in a very queer city. And so I was like, OK, well, that's, you know, that's right in my demographic. You know, that's that's my audience. Mm-hmm. So they were super happy to interview me. Um, I think that those things are really worthwhile. I think that guest blogs for me are a little bit dangerous in that. Uh, or not dangerous, but just like they're all, they're a lot of work. Cause if I write an essay, I put so much time into that essay that I will lose days. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, if I do an interview, it's an hour and like 
it's like taking a test, right? Like you're, <laughs> you show up, you do the thing and then you're done and you walk away and go, God, I hope I didn't sound like an idiot, Yeah, you know, but like with an essay, uh, I will spend way too much time on it. So I've tried to be really selective about where I'm writing things for free, but in terms of interviews, like take everything you can get. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, one thing that also surprised me that I did not expect is, so I've been on Twitter forever. Um, I, have a reasonably decent following on there by my standards. Um, but my publisher was like, Hey, you need to be on Instagram. And I was like, do I, do I really like really? And they were like, you need to be on Instagram. Um, because that was where that is where young adult, like book people hang out. Um, as I think the, uh, one of the marketing folks told me, he said, Twitter is a place where you go to have a fight. And I was like, Ooh, that's a, you're not wrong. Like, it, it used to be funny, but it used to be where all my science fiction friends hung out and told jokes. But uh, but yeah, but ever since I got on Instagram, they were right. Like, Bookstagram is really friendly and really fun. And there's a lot of, you know, especially, I guess, maybe just for the queer book community uh, and a lot of the younger folks, they are there. So I think that having a presence there can be really useful. And then, frankly, just reaching out to you know, people who have, you know, modestly good followings um, that you, if you like their stuff, uh, say, hey, could I send you uh, a digital arc of my book? You know, could I, you know, you don't even have to spend any money on it. Just say, hey, I like, I like your work. Here's what I've done. Maybe you'd be interested in it. Um, and just see what happens. And actually, I will plug one other, one other thing. The Publishing Rodeo podcast is re is brand new but really good and there's an uh episode on there that is uh with the sullivans all about how to market your stuff um where i felt like they dropped a lot of knowledge on that one so uh i i enjoyed that as well so that's that's what i've been doing that's great that's that's a lot of good information and I wrote some of the stuff down for the uh, show notes. Uh, Catwood says, thank you. Great advice. Uh, Daniel asked, did you create a playlist for writing this book or one that complements the story? Ooh. Um, so I did not do a playlist only because I go back and forth on whether I listen to music when writing. There was a time when I really liked it. Uh, but recently I've been more of a write in silence kind of guy. Um I will say I was listening to a lot of sub radio when I wrote this book um, and that uh, that popped up in here. But one thing I did get to do, which was very exciting for me, was uh, so for the audiobook, Macmillan Audio picked up the, the rights and made the audiobook, which is amazing because they also picked uh, like one of the books that made me want to write a young adult contemporary romance was Red, White, and Royal Blue. Oh, I love that uh, one, yeah. Yeah, and the audiobook is hilarious. It's read by Ramon de Ocampo. And he was the voice that I was hearing in my head when I wrote this book. So when they pitched me different narrators, I was like, these people are all great. Can we find somebody who, or like, you know, can we just ask them to try and do it like Ramon does in Red, White, and Royal Blue? Um, and the producer got back to me and was like, do you want us to just ask Ramon? It's like, that that's an option. But, and so, yeah. So he agreed to do it and did a great job. And then, uh, fulfilling another bucket list item, you know, every audiobook you listen to has that little like intro and outro music mm -hmm. in there. And I was like, somebody, they're getting that from somewhere. Like somebody's making it. So I, uh, I asked Macmillan audio, like, Hey, who composes that for you and could I apply to do it? And they got back to me and were just like, oh, go for it. And so I got to write the intro and outro music to my book. That's um, awesome. Yeah, which is like, that's been a fantasy for like 10 years. So that was really fun. That's great. Well, I'm nearing the end of my questions. I do want to ask you, um, and especially with your varied background, I'm eager to hear yeah. the an answer to this. What, but what advice do you give to beginning writers? Okay. Um, from any of your walks of life. Okay. So I've got probably a lot. Let me see if I can distill it down. Um, I already talked about sort of the hubris angle. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a quote that helped me a lot when I was first starting out. And 
It's by Orson Scott Card, who I very much disagree with, but he's right about this quote, um, where he says, uh, send out today the best work you're capable of doing today. In a year, you'll be able to do better, but in a year, you should be working on the thing that excites you then, not reworking this year's story. And so uh, that's that's sort of a thing that I've all, always really embraced. In the same way, actually, probably a better version of that is uh, at some point, Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine said something along the lines of, you get good at playing shows by playing shows. And, yeah. I, and so I've very much taken the philosophy of just do it the best you can and then put it out there and don't self-reject. Let other people reject you um, because occasionally they won't. And then you'll get your stuff out there. And, you know, I've very much gotten to grow up in public for better and worse um, where, you know, I've been publishing since I was, you know, I was doing journalism when I was like 17 and then got my first short story published when I was maybe 20. Wow. And so... Yeah. And so like, I very much, and like, is that old stuff sometimes embarrassing now? Oh, of course. But like, it helped me get to where I need to be. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I also always think if you're going to do like role-playing games or any sort of freelance type thing, I think of it like Katamari Damacy, which is, I'm always, you know, you get your foot in the door any way you can. Like you get some little assignment that says, hey, I sold this thing, I did this work for money, and then you use that in your portfolio to get a bigger assignment, and then a bigger one, and then a bigger one. And you're just always rolling that snowball of your career that up and up and up. That is the best metaphor I've heard in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> right, but no, that's, like, that's always what that's I perfect. see in my head. Yeah, and like, that's very much the story of my career. Like The way I got started in the game industry was they, uh, there was an there was an open position for editor in chief of amazing stories at a company near my near where I lived in Seattle, and they also ran Dungeon and Dragon magazines, the the uh, classic. You know, now I guess they're online now, but like at the time, they were the classic print D and D magazines that had been around since like the seventies. Right. But they were looking for an editor in chief, and so I, being twenty, <laughs> emailed the you know the head of the company. Um, the CEO and said, Hey, I see you're looking for an editor in chief. I am totally not qualified, but here's what I've done. Here's like, you know, my press clippings from the stories I've already written. Do you have anything for me? And like, surprise, surprise, like Lisa Stevens, the CEO, brought me in and interviewed me. Wow. And must have must have liked my my hutzpah <laughs> because uh she hired me. Now what she hired me for was not editor in chief. It was to find images for their, uh, to Google images for their web store at a Nikola JPEG, just to make sure that everything was like the highest resolution they could find. So like an objectively terrible job, but that was my foot in the door. And then mm -hmm. that became an internship, that became a customer service job. And within maybe a year, I was an assistant editor on Dungeon Magazine. And then I just worked my way up through, you know, then being on the team when we created Pathfinder, right. then, you know, going on doing like a lot of the fiction stuff and being in charge of Starfinder and just always, always reaching for that next thing. Like I'm kind of a compulsive ladder climber and well, you know, that isn't necessarily always the best for your psyche. Um, I think it is very useful. Right. right. And so I'm always telling people, if you ever stop getting rejected, you're not shooting high enough, mm -hmm. right? So that's like, I get rejected all the time, but it's just because every time I start to get comfortable in a place, I try for that next thing, right? Right, And that's part of why I've jumped around. Like I could have very easily stayed creative director on Starfinder for, I mean, I'd, I could probably still be there now, you know, hopefully, um, because like we did a great job. The game was very successful and it was really fun in a lot of ways, but it was one of those things where at that point I'd spent 13 years in RPGs. The game was a wild success. And I went like, this is never gonna, you can't top this, mm -hmm. right? Like I came home from like, I'd gone to Gen Con where I was like walking down, you know, there were, there were lines of people to buy the book, like wrapping around like the convention center. And I'm just walking down the line, signing autographs, like I'm Johnny Depp or something. <laughs> and I just came home and was like, that's as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. Like it's never like, it's never going to get better than that. So why not 
pull a Calvin and Hobbes and just like ride my wagon off into the sunset now at the high point and then go do something else because I knew I still wanted to spend a lot of time writing novels because that was a mountain I hadn't fully climbed yet. And so uh, I guess we're we're getting away from, <laughs> from the advice a little bit, but I think I think it's important to just on the one hand, always be striving for the thing that you want. On the other hand, I think that a lot of a lot of author advice will tell you to just grind. It's like, oh, you got to write every day. You got to write all these things, you know, like, you know, but tell your kids not to talk to you. Like, you know, lock yourself in the closet and just write the book. And like, that's fine. But a thing that I learned after my second novel, uh, The Redemption Engine, like a thing that I realized is like, you know what? Whether I write two books or I write 200 books, uh, 80 years from now, I'm going to be dead. Yeah. And like when I'm dead, I do not care how many books I put out into the world because the point of writing books was because that seemed like a really fun way to live, Mm -hmm. right? Like it seemed like it would be a really fun experience to be an author and to get to spend my life writing stories. But when that life is over, like who cares? Mm -hmm. And so thinking about that allowed me to relax and just say like, look, I'm, I'm going to prioritize, you know, obviously writing is a priority, but also my friends, my family, playing music, going hiking, you know, all of those things are also priorities because they're what make for a good life. And so I think it's important to ask yourself if writing is making you miserable, like, why are you doing it? And it might be that if you're, it might be that you're able to just take some of the pressure off. And like, I found when I said, you know what, it's okay. It's okay. I don't have to you know, succeed in writing as quickly as humanly possible or as quickly as it's possible for me to succeed, I can relax and just kind of enjoy it. And when I did, I found that I still got almost as much writing done, but I felt better about my entire life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I wasn't, it wasn't like I was suddenly at every barbecue thinking in the back of my head about the words that I didn't write that day. Yeah, I was able to just be present in the rest of my life. And that's a lesson that I have to relearn with every book, sometimes, you know, on a monthly basis, <laughs> but just like, remember why you're doing it. Like the point is to do a fun, cool thing. So yeah. like, don't, don't make yourself miserable. Very cool. Thank you so much for your time, James. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. Like I said, I'm a big fan of the podcast. Well, um, the book is Dark Hearts. It is out now. And it is an awesome, heartfelt uh, YA romance. And, uh, I mean, you know, being compared to Red, White, and Royal Blue, that's just, that's just amazing. I know, right? Because that was an amazing book. So, um, it's a little bit terrifying every time <laughs> I see that comp where I'm like, ooh, don't, don't judge me. I mean, it's a similar style, but ooh, wow. Mm, okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Oh, where can we find you online, James? I didn't ask that other question. Yeah, I asked everybody. yeah. <laughs> um, so my website is just jameslsutter.com. It's got all you know links to all my different writing and projects, and you know anything you could want. If you want to listen to some of my metalcore or like see my musical theater projects, those are on there too. Um, but I'm also on James L. Sutter at Twitter, or sorry, at James L. Sutter on Twitter for you know. <laughs> for as long as that lasts. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm also on Instagram at, at James, uh, James underscore L underscore Sutter. And uh, yeah, I'm always happy to chat with folks. So if there's a question that you sort of came up while you were listening to this and you're like, oh God, I'd really love to know what he thinks about X. Like, shoot me a, shoot me a tweet. Like, happy to chat. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time, James. You're always awesome to talk to, and I hope I can get you back on with your next book. Or at the very least, hang out at a convention. Oh, I, I, well, I don't have convention news yet, but my next year is shaping up already, and I'm looking forward to it. So whenever I have 2024 news about conventions, I will let you guys know, of course. 
But that has been I Should Be Writing and I have been Mer Lafferty. I'm still Mer Lafferty and I'll still be Mer Lafferty when I stop recording. But you can find out more about me at merverse.com. And you can search for this or any of my podcasts on most podcatchers around the world. I have books. My latest book, Chaos Terminal, is available November 7th, but you can pre-order it now. It is the second Midsolar Murders book, but it is a standalone mystery. And so if you pick it up without picking up the first one, you should be okay. I'm able to do this through the help of Patreon. I'm able to release 18 years of free content because there are a handful of people who do help me monetarily. And if you find yourself helped by my stuff or want to join a really cool writing community on our Discord or want access to all of the archives without waiting for me to release one a week on I Should Have Been Writing, check out patreon.com slash mightymer and you'll get access to the archives, our exclusive Discord community, and the secret RSS feed that has no ads. Yeah, no ads for Patreon supporters. Because you get your own RSS feed. It's secret. And if you're a Patreon supporter and you're not subscribed to the RSS feed, then, you know, you should you should get on that. And I think that's it for me today. I will see you next week. I'm working with my assistant to try to get some strategies regarding planning these out a little bit better. Because I'm used to talking off the cuff. And, you know, I'd like to know. Plan in advance. That's my goal. But for now, I just want to get this up this week and then actually get some words down because I should be writing and so should you be. I Should Be Writing is available to you under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Theme music by John Anilio. Art by Numbers Ninja. Production by Summer Brooks. And hosting by Libsyn. Find all of this information and more at merverse.com. And remember, we can't do this without you. Thanks for your support. Doctor